Harrison Ingram just showed the blueprint to transfers. Come to Carolina and resurrect your draft stock. Are more going to follow? You are locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Monday, July 1st, 2024. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you're joining us at the place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making us your first listen or watch. Special shout out to all you everydayers and all the members of the Locked On Tar Heels Discord family. So glad that you are all here. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. As playoffs wind down, the sports stop sportsing like we want them to, but this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Coming up on the show today, we want to look at uh, Harrison Ingram. Yes, his landing spot with the Spurs. I think it's a great fit and some news on Armando Baycott and Cormac Ryan, um, but specifically what Harrison Ingram getting drafted means want to take a peek ahead to early thoughts about the 2025 draft as well and any Tar Heels that might be in that. So happy Monday, happy July to everybody. Let's dive in. Harrison Ingram is what, what just happened to him late last week is what North Carolina needs to prove that they are capable of. One of two ways. Come to UNC and revive your NBA draft hopes. That is that is Harrison Ingram, right? McDonald's All-American yeah, at Stanford, and now he goes in the 24 NBA draft. Or option two, come to North Carolina and put yourself in the draft conversation maybe for the first time. For example, Cade Tyson with a baller year has an opportunity to do that. Think Cam Johnson-y, right? Um and I know it took Cam two years, but Cade could do the same thing. He's got that eligibility. That's a possibility as well. And we all remember what Cam did. We all remember where Cam got drafted. We all remember Kobe White's wild expression, right? That's the possibilities of what we're talking about here. But Cam was pre this transfer portal era, and Harrison Ingram is part of it. And that is critical. So let's go back and set the stage a little bit because for a long time, I think we can all remember, it was about proving that you could take elite high-level high school talent that was expected to be one and done, develop them, make it happen what needed to happen, and get them to the league within one year. That, that was the goal. That was what a lot of people were trying to do. It felt like, and I'm sure you felt this with me, right? For a long time, the Tar Heels were ragged on and bagged on for not being able to do that with somebody like Harrison Barnes, right? Oh, Harrison Barnes, number one recruit in the nation, comes in and he's got to come back for his sophomore year because his freshman year wasn't, it's like, oh, sure, fine, whatever. If you want to say that, fine. <clears throat> But it, it it's not now just about that with high school. In, in this day and age, not only is it about showing, sure, that maybe you can do that with high school players, but as high school players are devalued more than ever before, it's about showing now that transfers can do that. So it's not only... Hey, let me show you that this is a place where you can come transfer portal player X and have massive team success. This is a place where you can come and put yourself either back in the draft conversation or into it for the first time. And to be fair, I think this was harder for some players in the Roy Williams era as Carolina was kind of left behind in terms of modernization. I don't think we feel that way in terms of on-court success till the very, 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 very end. Um, I think we feel like Carolina did very well, thank you very much, at, at developing and doing things, but it didn't necessarily always translate into you come here and, you know, like Kobe White was more the exception than the rule for Carolina, right? I think we can acknowledge that. But now Coach Davis is showing 
a willingness already to modernize in how things are played. And I think we're even going to see another step in that modernization journey this season by what I expect Carolina to do. I believe this year we're going to see an even more modern style, frankly, based on Carolina's roster and, and personnel and what they're going to have to do. And so, look, yes, I know that I'm saying this like, ooh, look at what Harrison Ingram did. And now Carolina can can bank on that or, or excuse me, not bank on that, but bank that, build on it and continue to do things like that. And some of you are going to say, yeah, Isaac. Okay, cool. But guess what? Harrison Ingram, it's not like he was a first round draft pick or a uh, first round pick. Yeah. He was 48th overall, you know, mid to late second rounder. Okay, sure. Fine. But let's remember this after being a McDonald's all American, he went to Stanford, didn't go to the NBA draft after his freshman year or his sophomore year. And then he comes to North Carolina resurrects it, shows he's a new player, shows what he's capable of in playing with higher level elite talent where his NBA draft hopes were previously essentially dead. And now he is drafted, period. I don't care where it was. He was drafted. Harrison Ingram, because he came to North Carolina, played with new guys, better guys, to prove what he was capable of, of playing at a bigger level. So now... Harrison Ingram came to North Carolina. He experienced a regular season championship. He experienced being a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. And now he has experienced hearing his name called in the NBA draft. And what I'm wondering then is how much, how big a part of the pitch that becomes going forward. Because I know that Brady Manick didn't end up being drafted. Although, come on, seriously? I still don't understand that one. Um, obviously, Pete Nance wasn't drafted. So Carolina yet hasn't had a ton of success in the transfer portal era of getting you know uh, transfers drafted at a high level. I mentioned Cam Johnson, but obviously that was pre-transfer portal era. Remember how hard it was to get him over from Pitt? It'd be easy this day and age. <clears throat> so now with Harris Newman, you begin to see part of what Carolina can do for you. And I think that has to become part of the recruiting pitch because obviously outside of Cade Tyson and Van Allen Lubin, either Carolina didn't pull the trigger on guys or guys didn't pull the trigger on Carolina this transfer portal season. And so I'm really curious if what just happened late last week is going to change some of that narrative now going forward. Hey, come here, resurrect or become a draft prospect for the first time and get to the league. That's it. Simple. It's got to be. It's got to be part of the pitch. You see how we're playing. You see this modern style. Come be part of it. Win games and get yourself drafted. Let's make it happen. Get more guys here. Would love to see it. Now, Harrison Ingram, he goes to the Spurs at 48th overall. I love the draft pick. We're going to talk about that. Plus, what happened with Armando Baycott and Cormac Ryan. We'll get to all that coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you about FanDuel, look, you know I love sports and I love them so much. I just never want them to stop, even in the midst of summer. I'd keep rolling, be reporting it to you guys all the time. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports on, aren't sportsing like we want them to. Really, all we got left right now is baseball and the upcoming Olympics. But FanDuel lets me and you keep the sports going whenever we want. All we got to do is open up the app. Dream up bets anytime we're in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. I went and looked up the National League odds to earn the number one seed in the NL. Right now, Phillies lead that at minus 115, followed by the Dodgers at plus 105, Braves plus 700, Brewers plus 2,500, and the Padres, fifth best odds. Plus 18,000. I probably ain't going past the Brewers, but, uh, you know, probably Phillies or Dodgers are going to be your pick there. So if you want to get in on that action, head on over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports partner, betting partner of Major League Baseball. Last Friday, we had a fun uh, football show with Denora Searcy, so we didn't get to talk uh, NBA draft wrap-up stuff, the landing spot, 
uh, for Harris Sninger. We're going to talk about what, what became of things with Armando Baycott and Cormac Ryan. So why don't we hit that now today? Um, Harris Ingram, we kind of alluded to it in the last segment, but lands to the Spurs at pick number 48. Can you imagine, uh, you know, a little earlier than this last year, Harris Ingram's just like, I'm, I guess I'm going to transfer to North Carolina. And now he's playing with Victor Wembenyama. I mean, that's bonkers, right? It's crazy. So for Harris Ingram, I hate that he fell that far to number 48, but the Spurs is a great place to be. It's a great franchise. They're rebuilding. Um, and so let's look at that, the, oh man, that's a bummer side of it. You know, I mean, there was some buzz that people were mentioning for him as a late first rounder I, to be very honest with you. And obviously I'm not getting inside Intel from, uh, general managers or NBA front offices, but I just didn't see it. And, and quite frankly, not, not because of Harrison, but literally the only place I was seeing that high of a, a big board landing spot for him was Jonathan Wasserman from Bleacher Report. Nowhere else was that popping up for me. I started to see him sneak up a little bit, but then he started to fade. And so all along, I thought mid to late second round. And I know a lot of people are saying, because I, I saw a lot of this over the weekend. Oh, Harrison made a bad decision. He got bad intel or whatever. I I, I don't think so. I think he kind of knew the deal, right? Um Th these guys are made well aware of the possibility of ranges of where they're going to land. And so, um, you know, I mean, you do have to wonder, like if you had said to Harrison Ingram before he made his decision to stay in the draft, <clears throat> for, if you had told him the number 48, would he have stayed in? I don't know the answer to that. Oh, you know, only he can ultimately, but I'm so happy for him because at the end of the day, um, sure. You'd love to be drafted high, but a lot of times the higher the draft pick you are, the worst team you're on. And I know that the Spurs are in a little bit of a, a rebuild ish mode. You know, they got kind of lucky, lucky last season, getting the first round or excuse me, the first overall pick and getting Wemby. And then this year they get the fourth pick get Steph castle, eventually get Harrison. And so, um, really, really interesting to see there. So, uh, you know, obviously we would love to have Harrison Ingram back, but I think it's good for him to be able to go on. And I think it's good for North Carolina for him to have come in one year, boom, he gets drafted. So I, I really think he could be part of this exciting young core in San Antonio. I don't think at this point it projects that Harrison Ingram is ever going to be like an NBA all-star, but because of who he is, because of his professionalism, because of his work ethic, because of his skill set. I think that he is somebody that could be a consistent contributor for an NBA team for a long time. And yeah, I mean, you, you never know, right? How things are going to play out or injuries or anything like that, but there's nothing glaring. That's like, no, Harrison Ingram can't do it. Also. I love this because my in-laws live really close to San Antonio in new Braunfels. So that's fun as well. So uh, you look at the Spurs, it's a, or, an organization that needs talent, that needs wing help, that needs length, that needs people with like kind of guard playmaking capability, that needs versatility. And as you and I know, that describes Harrison Ingram to a T, all of that, right? The ability to play on the wing, the, the length, he's got very, he's got plus wingspan for his height. Um, the ability to play make, he's got versatility, so many things he can do. And so I think this is a great fit for the Spurs who are just trying to find wings that can hop in and do stuff, whether it's at the three or the four. I love, you know, Danny Green, who was such a critical part of this organization, could probably pour some insight and wisdom into Harrison about this. I'm sure they've already talked about it, right? Um, I love, you know, you think about Greg Popovich and just, He's kind of his own dude, right? And I think Harris Ingram is going to buy into that well. Um, Pop demands professionalism. He doesn't suffer fools, right? That's Harris Ingram, man. He is a professional. He's a great locker room guy, great energy, great personality. But, man, he gets the work done. And, <clears throat> again, you think about other young talents like Wemby in year two, Steph Castle, who's going to be a very, very good player, I fully believe. Um, with have, but with having those young guys, having a 
rally to your teammate, don't mess with my guy kind of guy like Harrison Ingram, I think is critical for Wemby, who looks like I could break him in half with a flick of my finger. Um, so Harrison's thickness and, and team all in this, I think is a win. Now, as you think of some of these skill sets for Harrison, that'll, that'll play well. Yes. At Carolina, we didn't see as much of his passing as he had at Stanford. It's just, you know, part of what Carolina was asking him to do and not do. Um, but I, obviously it's there and he can do it. Averaged over five assists a game. Uh, I believe his sophomore year at Stanford. Do I remember that correctly? Um, no, three, 3.7 assists per game, his, uh, sophomore year. I had that number too high in my head, but anyway, still, um, is highly capable there. That's going to be a critical skill set to help get him on the floor in San Antonio. I think though, the biggest thing, the single biggest thing that Harrison Ingram has to prove is that his three point shooting last year at Carolina was not an anomaly. He had not shot well his first two years at Stanford. The numbers were in his freshman year, he shot 31.3%, sophomore year 31.9%, and then last year jumped all the way up to 38.5. And I know some people are going to look at that and say, that's the anomaly of the three. But you, if you've been with me, you know that I have said consistently and constantly. Is that the same word? Is that too close of a synonym? You know that I've said over and over and over again. Harrison Ingram became the dude because he didn't have to be the dude. By playing with better talent at North Carolina, I think it freed him up to do the things that he does well. And I think that includes shooting really well from outside. So a, a higher percentage, close up to 40%, on more attempts per game. 4.6 attempts was the highest of his three years in college. Now I get it. A big concern is that his free throw percentage is still so bad. 61.2% last year on his fewest attempts of his career, 2.6 per game. So that could be an argument for last year's three-point shooting being an, anom an anomaly. But for Harrison, he's got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, got to prove that he can do what he did last year from beyond the arc. But other things that he can do well, his, his rebounding grew very well last year. It was 6.7 boards a game to five down to 5.8 his sophomore year, but up to 8.8 .8 last year. He was up in offensive and defensive rebounds uh, per game, career high 2.6 offensive rebounds per game, career high 6.2 defensive rebounds per game. Harrison's got all that capability. And so if I had to project his role, you get a 3 and D wing player off the bench who will be able to help with playmaking duties, take smaller threes into the paint, help with rebounding, which is going to be key along with that three-point shooting, and provide that spark and that energy coming off the bench. You know that Harrison Ingram, if you bring him into a game, he's going to just inject life into your team. And I think that's a huge win, especially at the NBA level. And so I, I think that's the two critical things I'm watching for as we get towards Summer League. How is his three-point shooting playing? And how is his rebounding playing? I, he's got to do those keep providing that defense, keep providing that shooting at a 35 or greater clip, 35% or greater clip. And he might just make a long career for himself in the NBA. If not, Harrison's clearly going to have a role overseas somewhere. And so I, I'm really, really interested to see how things go for him. I, I wouldn't, um, I, I don't, I don't want to project right now. Right. But um, it's going to be a lot of fun to see. Now, <clears throat> as I said, we also got to mention, uh, Armando Baycott and Cormac Ryan have both signed some deals. We want to talk about that and project ahead to the 2025 NBA draft. And any Tar Heels going to land there? We'll look ahead at all that coming up in just a second. Unfortunately, Armando Baycott and Cormac Ryan neither were drafted in the NBA draft, but have both signed um, undrafted free agent exhibit 10 deals. We, If you ever hear the short, uh, you know, the acronym UDFA, uh, that's undrafted free agent. So both Armando and Cormac signed exhibit 10 deals for Armando. It's with the Jazz and Kyle Filipowski. And by the way, what on earth is going on there? That story is wild. I need, I, I want all the confirmation on that. I need to know. I'm, I'm just, I found myself in the weeds on that story. You probably did too. Cause it is what is happening. Anyway, I, I can't 
quit thinking about that. And then Cormac Ryan has signed an Exhibit 10 deal with Oklahoma City with the Thunder, which I love because that's just about three and a half hours for me. Uh, if he's able to somehow make that roster, would be able to go see him. What is an Exhibit 10 deal, you ask? I'm so glad you asked. Let me just read to you the definition. Non-guaranteed one-year deal that's worth the minimum league salary and guarantees a player a spot in training camp. So um, not, not a guaranteed roster spot. Again, non-guaranteed, but it does guarantee a spot in training camp. So you have the opportunity to make the roster. Um, it can be converted into a two-way contract. And if so, uh, that that uh, deal is converted, is guaranteed, excuse me, for the amount of the Exhibit 10 bonus, which is a $50,000 bonus. So you'd love to get that. So um, excited for these guys to at least get a chance uh, to show what they've got and maybe they can latch on. And if not, I'm sure they will both find great landing spots in other professional opportunities. So um, when will we get to see them in action? Great news. Summer League starts this coming Saturday, July 6th. You love to see that. The Spurs actually are in action on Saturday against Charlotte. So we'll see if uh, Harrison's playing right out of the gate there. And then for the Jazz and Thunder, they will pick up their action on Monday, July 8th. So a week from today, they both play. Uh, again, Armando with the Jazz, Cormac with the Thunder. And then, interestingly enough, those two teams play each other on Tuesday, July 9th. So watch for that next Tuesday when those teams are squaring off against one another. All right. I also want to look ahead, just, just start that, that far out view of the 2025 NBA draft. Because it's one thing, you know, to this point, it's been all like rankings and where do these guys fall in, the, in their recruiting rankings either for high school or transfer. And then now the NBA minds, now that 24 is over, really start turning their attention to uh, the 2025 NBA draft and where these guys are going to fall. Um, <clears throat> and so I've just started going through, combing through all sorts of 2025 NBA drafts um, to look to see if there are any Tar Heels in them. Um, because sometimes Guys that we expect to be drafted, it's for one reason or another, they just don't have draft things, you know, NBA things. And guys, it's like, oh, really? Him? All right. Uh, are <laughs> NBA draft kind of material. So um, let me just give you some potentials on these. I want to start. I'm not going to read through all of these, but I do want to read through a couple of them, give you some ideas of different um, people's evaluations and thoughts about next year's Tar Heels. So this one is from CBS Sports from Adam Finkelstein and Travis Branham, uh, who are two of the great um, recruiting analysts at CBS Sports. They did one that's just a first round. It's got Elliot Cadeau at 17, Ian Jackson at 28, and Drake uh, Powell is not in it. Now, what's interesting, and, and now there are others, but uh, I mentioned Drake specifically because he does show up in other mock drafts. But I mentioned theirs first because I really like how they did it. For those of you uh, that play like fantasy sports, fantasy football, fantasy basketball, whatever, um, I'll just put it with fantasy football because that's the most ubiquitous. Let's say you're wanting to decide on drafting wide receiver. And whoever the, the ranker is will do a tiered system instead of just straight 1 to 50 they will say, hey, tier one of wide receivers is Justin Jefferson and whoever else. Tier two of wide receivers is et cetera, et cetera. So that you can know, hey, these, these five guys are all about the same in tier two, but if they're all off the board, I might want to look at running backs in tier two before diving down to wide receiver tier three. Does that make sense? So I love it because they actually took that same approach, but with NBA draft, they did uh, a tiered first round approach broken up into potential number one picks, probable lottery picks, potential high end lottery picks, potential lottery picks and round one candidates. So for example, potential number one picks, the only two were Cooper flag, who's at Duke and ACE Bailey, who's at Rutgers. By the way, if you're not aware of this, Rutgers has two of the top freshmen in the entire country this season. It's wild. Um, and so for those two Carolina guys that showed up on this list, both Elliot and Ian were in the round one candidate. So that fifth tier of round one. So I just thought that was a really interesting way to look at this instead of just saying number one, number two, number three, just taking a tiered approach in addition to ranking them in, in order like that. 
Another one I turned to was Jonathan Gavoni from ESPN. He did a full two round, well, almost full 58 slots. I'm not sure if the 25 draft is going to be two picks short again next season. Um, but, you know, anyway, he had all three uh, of the Tar Heels I've, I've mentioned already. And interestingly enough, and this is <clears throat> for that, you know, we've, there's kind of been some debate on Locked on Tar Heels lately between the two highest incoming freshmen for the Tar Heels, who's going to be the bigger deal between Drake Powell and Ian Jackson, uh, both in terms of Carolina impact and in terms of NBA draft. Gavoni has Drake Powell, not Ian Jackson, as his 11th pick in the 25 draft, followed by Ian Jackson at 25th. So that, you know, I know a lot of people, that's not the order they have, but you, I'm just, that's from Jonathan Gavoni, who does this all the time. And then Elliot Cadeau at 47th. Um, how about Bleacher Report and Jonathan Wasserman? He too has Drake Powell listed ahead of Ian Jackson. He did a first round only. Drake at 21, Ian Jackson at 24, no other Tar Heels. Um, busting Brackets, Tristan Freeman actually had no Tar Heels in his first round. NBA draft room is always one I'm interested to look at. It is not high on any Tar Heels. It goes way out on beyond the second round. Part of it is it's weird. They listed Ian and Drake both in the 26 draft, but not in the 25 draft. And um, everyone else was outside the top 100, but you got like Elliot at 116, Cade Tyson at 117, RJ at 121, Jay Wash at 171. So, yeah. All right. Whatever there. Uh, USA Today, Sydney Her Henderson and Jeff Zilgit uh, did a first round only. Ian was highest at 15. Drake at 18. That was the only two. On threes, James Fletcher did a first round only. Ian at 14. Drake at 24. No Elliot Cadeau or anyone else. SB Nation, Ricky O'Donnell had a first round with Ian at 10. Drake at 26. And Elliot Cadeau uh, not on there at all. Um, I read one on Reddit that, you know, you take some of that with a grain of salt, but it was interesting to me because the highest uh, drafted Tar Heel on this list, Cade Tyson at 15, Ian at 17, no other Tar Heels. Now I found that one interesting because again, what I went back to come to Carolina, find your way into this draft and make your dreams come true, right? That's what that shows there with Cade. Also kind of frustratingly, Jaron Stevenson's name just kept popping up everywhere. And I'm like, uh, why didn't you come to Carolina? Why didn't you just wait a year? And why did you go to Alabama? I'm still just bitter and uh, sour grapes on that. Anyway, uh, kind of fun NBA draft talk today. Looking back, looking ahead, looking at what it all means for Carolina. Fun show. Hope you enjoyed it. We'd love to hear your thoughts on how Carolina can interact with all this. All right. Fun to be together today. If you're not subscribed to the show on video and audio already, go ahead and do so. Make sure you get in on that. If you haven't joined the Locked on Tar Heels Discord, man, we would love to have you. The link is in the show notes. It's free to join. Come for the Tar Heels. Stay for the community. Want to remind you that it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll be back again tomorrow on Tuesday. But until then, peace.